When analyzing potential malware, should you examine the file statically first or just run it to see what it does? In my experience, static analysis is the safer, more controlled starting point. And more importantly, it helps you ask better questions to guide deeper analysis. In this video, I'll show you several tools I use to evaluate malware before running it. And if you stay until the end, we'll even use what I discussed to extract code from multi-stage malware. So on my desktop here, I have a file named unload.dll. As always, see the description for a link to the file if you wanna follow along. So with a target file in front of me, the first thing I like to do is toss it into a hex editor. Now there are many options out there when considering hex editors, but the one I like to use is called hxd, which you'll see here on my desktop on the top left. So let me go ahead and drag and drop unload.dll into hxd here. And loading this in a hex editor might seem like a weird first step, after all, it just shows you the raw bytes and their text representation. But I think it's valuable, even if you're just starting out and don't fully understand the structure of a Windows executable, to start getting comfortable looking at the actual bytes that make up a file. As you can see, this file begins with the characters M and Z, which is typical for a Windows executable. It marks the start of what's called the DOS header at the beginning of the binary. Soon after that, we see the string, this program cannot be run in DOS mode, which is also standard for Windows executables. Now, if I scroll down a bit, you'll see that we hit a series of null bytes right here. This usually means that the header has ended and we're actually at the start of the first section, which in this case would begin right here. Windows executables are generally made up of multiple sections. And the first one, which I just pointed to here, usually contains code. That's why you typically, if I scroll down here, you won't see many readable characters because again, this is all code. So that's all I'm really gonna do with the hex editor for now. Now I just mentioned strings, so let's stay on that topic for a moment. For my next step when performing static file analysis, I'll usually extract ASCII and Unicode strings using a tool like the SysInternals String64 utility. And to help me focus on the strings most likely to be malicious, I combine it with another tool, and that tool is String Sifter. String Sifter is an open source utility that uses a machine learning model to rank strings based on how interesting or suspicious they might be for reverse engineering purposes. After a simple install via pip, String Sifter gives you two scripts, Flare Strings, which is similar to String64, and Rank Strings, which ranks the strings based on importance. So if I wanna prioritize embedded strings in unload.dll, I'll go ahead and open up a command prompt here. So I'll type strings64, which I already have in my path, followed by no banner so that it doesn't display the EULA information, followed by unload.dll. And then I'm gonna go ahead and pipe that to rank strings. And then I'll pipe that to more. And then I'll hit enter. So the output puts the most relevant strings at the top. For example, I see a DLL referenced here that is often used for internet connectivity. I also see a reference to a DLL name here. Uh, that could refer to maybe the developer's internal naming of this DLL. And I also see some cookie fields here that could be included in the HTTP headers. Now, everything I just said is just a theory, but forming early ideas about a file's functionality helps guide the rest of my analysis. It really just gives me something to look for. Now, these days, attackers know that analysts often start by pulling strings from a file, as I just did, so they'll frequently hide or obfuscate them to avoid easy detection. So how can you tell if strings are encoded or intentionally hidden? It's not always straightforward, but a tool that can quickly reveal obfuscated strings is called Floss. Floss works by analyzing code that appears to decode strings, and then it emulates the execution of that code to potentially recover hidden content. And since it's not actually running the code, only simulating execution, I still think it fits into my static analysis phase, which is why we're discussing it here in this video. Just keep in mind, Floss won't necessarily decode all obfuscated strings, so you'll still wanna dig deeper if something looks suspicious. So if I wanna run Floss to identify any obfuscated strings in unload.dll, I'll run the following command. First, let me go ahead and just uh, clear my screen. And the command to run is floss dash dash no static dash dash followed by the name of the DLL. So I'm using the dash dash no static option because I don't need to see the regular ASCII and Unicode strings. I've already reviewed those. I only want floss to output stack strings and other decoded strings. And the dash dash is used as an end of options marker, meaning that what comes next is a positional argument, basically the file name and not a command line option. I'll then go ahead and press enter. 
and we'll wait to see what decoded strings are presented. So in this case, you'll see it only returns one string, well, technically two, but they appear to be the same, unless I'm losing my mind. It looks like a domain name, and if we were to go back to our earlier strings output, this one wasn't there, meaning Floss probably did deobfuscate something for us. And here's where static analysis shines. This kind of clue helps me form a theory. Maybe the malware deobfuscates the C2 server location at runtime and then tries to call out to that domain at a later time. Now, when I run the sample during the dynamic analysis phase of my reverse engineering process, which I will typically do after completing this phase, I'll look to confirm that. And if I see the network traffic, great. It supports my theory. But even if I don't, that's still useful. It tells me there may be a condition the malware needs before reaching out, and now I've got a new path to investigate. And finally, my favorite tool for performing static file analysis of Windows executables is PE Studio. I have PE Studio here on my desktop, and to use it, I'm simply going to drag and drop onload.dll to the PE Studio icon here on my desktop. This tool gives you a really nice overview of a Windows executable. It very cleanly, for example, shows you basic information, such as the fact that this is a 64-bit Windows DLL. Uh, you can also see the compiler timestamp here, although keep in mind, uh, this can be modified and stomped. And we also have, interestingly, a, a DLL name here, which is the same output we saw when running string 64 uh, against this file. So it does turn out to be the original file name here uh, as specified by the developer. In addition, we have a ton of information on the left-hand side with uh, red and sometimes yellow colors used to direct our attention to suspicious characteristics. Now, we don't have time to click through each and every kind of subsection here, but for example, if I click on, well, the sections area here, we can see the various parts that make up this executable. So at the top here, you'll see that there is a section called .text, another one called rdata, Dot data and so on. So there's one column for each section uh, that is uh, within this, this Windows executable. Now, what I also want to draw your attention to is this characteristics field down here, right? And this is basically a table of the various permissions that apply to each section. Now, most executables have one executable section, and it's typically named dot text. But in this case, you can see PE Studio is highlighting two sections that have executable permissions. One is in fact called .text, but the other one is called .c, which is definitely unusual. Now, going back to the left-hand side, we can click on Libraries, which lists all of the imported DLLs. In other words, the DLLs that this DLL relies upon. Notice this includes winhttp.dll, which we did in fact see in the strings output uh, that can be used to perform, again, internet communications. So this could be how this suspicious file is communicating perhaps with that C2 server that Floss decoded for us. And if I click on imports on the left-hand side, we see these specific APIs within each imported DLL that unload.dll imports, including several referencing HTTP communications right here, and probably no surprise that these are imported from winhttp.dll. Now, most DLLs exist to export functionality. So if I click on export here on the left-hand side, I would expect to at least see one exported function. And in this case, we do only have one exported function and it is named init. This is an important observation because if I proceed to perform behavioral analysis against this sample by actually running it, I now have an entry point in mind to execute when I actually launch this DLL. Now I'll go ahead and briefly click on strings, although we already talked extensively about strings. Uh, if you wanna see the strings that PE Studio is highlighting for you, you can sort by this flag, and you'll see that uh, these are some of the strings that it is calling your attention to. And by the way, there are configuration files that you can update and modify if you want to, for example, add additional strings that you want PE Studio to alert on. And finally, PE Studio notes that this file has an overlay. Let me go ahead and click on overlay. An overlay is basically data after the file should have technically ended. This isn't always malicious. And in this case, if I were to go ahead and proceed to dump this content down to disk, there actually really isn't much there. So we're not gonna proceed past this point when taking a look at this particular file. Now I did promise you something a bit more exciting than this. And for that, we're gonna use a ducktail sample. Ducktail is an info stealer. And the sample I have here on my desktop is called singlefilehost.exe. If 
I go ahead and drag and drop this into PE Studio and just wait a moment for PE Studio to go ahead and parse this file, there are a few interesting areas that I want to highlight. First, PE Studio draws our attention to the resources section. If I go ahead and click on this, it tells me about the various components and items within the resource section. And what you can see if I go ahead and expand this third column here is it's identified potentially an executable stored within the resource section. Now to dig deeper, I can actually go ahead and dump this down to disk. So I can right click, go to instance, and then dump to file. I'm gonna to go to the desktop here and I'll just call this resource and it'll automatically add a .dump extension. So let me save this, go to my desktop, and here is the resource.dump file that I just created. Now let me go ahead and drag this into PE Studio to further process it. So first off, we can confirm that this is a Windows 64-bit DLL. Next, we could view some of the highlighted information on the left. Now, we've already looked at imports before, so let's take a look at something different and uh, check out this certificate view. So this view right here provides information about the digital signature of the dumped executable. And even though if you look at the valid to date here, the certificate is technically expired, it is still trusted. And we can see it's actually signed by Microsoft. So this suspicious program actually has a legitimate Microsoft executable embedded in the resource section, which is interesting. Sometimes malware is paired with a legitimate program to perform DLL sideloading, though we would have to dig deeper to confirm if that's in fact what's happening here. Now let's return back to single file host.exe in PE Studio. If I can find that among my many PE Studio windows here, ah, there we go. Another area I wanna highlight is the overlay section. And you might recall I mentioned that overlay uh, contains data that occurs after the file should have technically ended. Now you can see that the signature as identified by PE Studio is unknown, meaning that PE Studio doesn't quite know what type of content this is. And we also get visibility into the first 32 bytes, which appears to be all zeros. Now, because there are all these zeros, I might suspect that the entire overlay is full of null bytes. But if we look at the entropy, you can see that it's 6.73. And the reality is, is that if the overlay were all nulls, the entropy would actually be zero. So there's definitely some kind of data in there. And this is also supported by the fact that the file ratio here is 87.52%, meaning that the overlay takes up 87% of this entire single file host.exe file, which is a large portion of that entire file. To take a closer look, I can right click here on the left hand side and actually dump this overlay to disk by right clicking and choosing dump to file. Then here on the desktop, I can just name it. I'm feeling creative, so I'll call it overlay. And again, it'll add the dot dump extension and hit save. Here I have my overlay.dump file. And since I really have no clue what type of content is contained within here, I will generally drag and drop this to my hex editor just to get a raw view of what type of data is contained here. And although it does begin with null bytes as PE Studio indicated, you'll see as I scroll down that we quickly see some characters we recognize, including MZ, followed by the this program cannot be run in DOS mode. So it looks like there is a Windows executable here in the overlay. So those null bytes were likely added to throw off an analyst or the tools that an analyst uses. In order to clean this up a bit, what I'm gonna do is go back to the top and I'm literally just gonna highlight these bytes leading up until the MZ. And then I'll hit backspace on my keyboard and I'll press okay to basically delete those uh, bytes from this file so that it actually begins with the MZ header. I can then go to file and save all. And now this file doesn't have those null bytes anymore, but rest assured there is a backup of the original file saved here. And if my current file is called overlay.dump, which it is, then the backup will be called overlay.dump.back. Okay, so you do have the original version if any sort of carving that you do ends up negatively impacting the file. But with that carving complete, if I take my overlay.dump file and drag it now into PE Studio, I do find that we have a 64-bit Windows executable now. Now, as I quickly look at some of these other static characteristics, I'll see, for example, a compiler timestamp, which is uh, definitely a little unusual. Let me make this a different color. Namely because we have a 2061 compiler 
uh, year here, which is uh, obviously not yet reached, at least last time I checked. So this is evidence that it was probably stomped and modified, perhaps using a, a hex editor sim similar to HXD. And check it out, there is yet another overlay right here as well. Uh, once more, the signature is unknown, but we can clearly see that there are uh, some non-null bytes at the beginning of this overlay. Uh, we have some text right there as well. And once again, the ratio of this overlay compared to the rest of the file is quite large. In this case, the overlay takes up 90% of this original uh, overlay.dump file. So clearly a lot more fun to be had here, but I'm gonna leave the rest of this analysis to you. So just based on static file analysis, we've already uncovered multiple stages of execution without ever running the sample. So there you have it. Static analysis can take you surprisingly far. We used HXD to inspect and edit files, several strings utilities to extract plain text and obfuscated strings, and PE Studio to pull together a more complete view of each executable. This workflow helps me decide which files deserve deeper analysis, and most importantly, it gives me a head start when I dive into dynamic analysis. If you have a favorite static analysis tool that I didn't cover, drop it in the comments and I'd love to check it out. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.